this is just a conversation. So you can imagine like at one of these, uh, one of these geek uh, tech conferences in San Francisco where you have Elon Musk over there, you know, and some newspaper, some wired magazine writer, but just don't do what Elon Musk did. You know, he, he cussed at the audience. <laughs> I would never do that. You would never do that. <laughs> well, um, Representative Darby, I think the elephant in the room is the fact that everyone out here and everyone out here is watching this recording has probably received a text message or a direct mail piece. And they probably received, I said this in a right, I wrote this one day, enough direct mail pieces to build their own personal Aggie bonfire. <laughs> That's a big fire. <laughs> yes, that's a really big fire. Um, they all say that you're, you're not a conservative, you're a liberal, and you're a rhino. In fact, if you guys watch X or Twitter, you know, um, Greg Abbott, our governor, called him a liar the other day. So I'm just going to put it out there. Representative Darby, are you a rhino? Which means Republican in name only. Well, Joe... First of all, thanks to everyone here. Um, can you hear me, by the way, or do I need to speak up? Okay. Well, I'll try to speak a little <laughs> louder then. Uh, thank you for being here. It's important that people participate in their government. In order to participate, you've got to be informed. And to be informed, you have to try to read. You have to try to be where people are congregated and try to inform yourself about the issues and so by your presence today clearly you have made that step and for that I'm I'm grateful I'm also grateful for Sangel Live for broadcasting this uh, there are folks that are homebound and folks that cannot be up here tonight and and what will happen is that this this taping hopefully will educate folks about some of the issues your question is kind of loaded, Joe. I know. I always ask okay. loaded questions. Said, <laughs> said the uh, spider to the fly. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but clearly, um, I guess the first rule in, in elections is uh, your opponent is always going to lie. So your best and only defense is to represent your district. And that's the rule that I uh, apply. And because I've represented my district, I take seriously my oath to represent the folks in House District 72. There are seven, there are 10 counties that I represent. 200,000 people that live and work in the Concho Valley. Yes, they're Republicans. Yes, they're Democrats. Yes, they're independents. There's old people, there's young people, there's infirm people, there's intellectually disabled people. There are folks that are looking to state government to provide them essential services that they need to live in a place like San Angelo or Robert Lee or Braun or Ballinger or all the little communities that make up West Texas. Since 2007, I haven't changed. I have voted my district every time. And so when somebody calls me a rhino, I kind of bristle up. I've not changed. I've not changed at all. Those of you, and I look at Kenneth Deerskin, some in the room, we didn't have Republican primaries in Tom Ring County in the 50s and the 60s. There weren't any Republicans. But in the 70s, I've moved back here out of law school in 72, and I went to work for a small law firm. My father was killed in a plane crash, and so my mother was widowed, and I felt the need to come back and, and help her and my younger sister. Never regretted that decision. But there weren't, there was Democrats. There were liberal Democrats. There were conservative Democrats. But everybody ran under the label of, of a Democrat. Well, in the early 70s, those of you of an age might remember the John Birch Society. Well, I worked for an attorney named Pat Hall. Probably there's never been a more conservative individual than, than Pat Hall. And another one was Ken Gunner were in the town. And they, they were a part of what was called back then the John Birch Society. 
William Buckley and others espoused conservative views. And those views resonated with me. And so when Bill Clements wanted to run for governor, a Republican candidate for governor in Texas, there was no Republican primaries. I have to organize the first Republican primary held in 1978 here. It took hold. The ideas took hold. And so we started trying to get Republican candidates to run for local offices. It's one thing to have a Republican governor, but it's another thing to have a Republican county commissioner or county judge. They were all Democrats, mind you. Well, over these years, we've been able to transition from a Republican, from a Democratic label to a Republican label. Have those folks changed really dramatically? They were conservative. They believed in rural Texas. They were believed in rural values, family, faith. Those are values that resonate with Republicans, certainly, but it, they resonate as rural folks that live and work in this part of the world. So when you see that stuff in the mail, accusing me of being a rhino, Republican in name only, it's coming to you from folks that live not in this state, not in this district, but in Alexandria, Virginia, or Chicago. Do you think any of those ad officials and consultants are conservative Republicans? They make money as grifters. <laughs> grifters trying to convince you that I'm not a Republican. They're lies. They're lies. But yet, they're making money trying to convince you We'll get into that in a minute. We'll get that in a minute. But I just want to, I want people to understand a little bit about your your I guess your growing up and and what formed you. You said you grew up in San Angelo and you know we do a lot of coverage of high school football for example, right? Friday night lights. Friday night lights. So were you a Central Bobcat? Did you play football for the? I was. So what, I was. what what was the what? Just I mean, give us a history lesson on that back <laughs> in back in the 1960s. Well, I can tell you, football was king then and it is now. Uh, I had the benefit of, of having been coached by two pretty good coaches. Uh, Spike Dykes was my linebacker coach okay. and Emory Ballard was my head coach. And uh, we won district. Uh, this was back in 62, 63, 64. And uh, we were ranked number one in the country at one time. But San Angelo Central High School in, in, in that experience, playing athletics, playing in, in, in West Texas football, which is king then and it is now, uh, kind of formed my life. It, it formed that, that, our, that our public schools are central and lifeblood of each community. I think we see that, I see it personally uh, when I'm traveling through these football games. I mean, uh, Ryan Chadwick and I have done just about every 6A football team, been to every stadium, mm -hmm. probably twice, maybe three times. Uh, we see it with the crowd size, particularly out here in West Texas. And this is something you may not understand. In the Metroplex, when, we, when Central was in the Metroplex district, when we had to travel there to play uh, um, those, those schools that beat us, like Arlington, Martin, and things like that, the stadiums weren't as full. They're big. I mean, there's more people going to show. And the smaller the school, the more people are in the stadium. Absolutely. So that kind of got me trying to think about this big issue that hit the, the Texas legislature this year, which was these private school vouchers. Now, I'm a conservative, just like everyone else is a conservative. I like, to, I like the idea that I, I can choose what school to send my kid to. I like the idea of the state subsidizing that choice too, sometimes because, you know, we're all, you know, we could use a little beer money, right? Um, but what, just give me your vision of public schools 
and why you stood up. I mean, you stood up against a firestorm of, of opposition in the House right now because you stood up for public schools. What is it about public schools, other than what I just told you, my anecdotal things of looking at the Friday Night Lights, what is it about public schools that are so important to our state and to our nation? They've been important to our state for a number of, well, for 200 years. Uh, Texas obtained its independence in 1836. And one of the first and primary reasons why Texas left and wanted to move away from uh, Mexico was the failure to implement a public education system. And I looked this up this afternoon and I, I thought I might need it, but I want to read some language to you that, that I think is, was important 200 years ago and it's just as important today. And this was in the Texas Declaration of Independence. It, being Mexico, has failed to establish any public system of education, although possessed of almost endless, uh, boundless resources, the public domain, and although it is an axiom in political science that unless a people are educated and enlightened, it is idle to expect the continuance of civil liberty or the capacity for self-government. That was written 200 years ago by folks, hard scrabble education. But they put it down in your Declaration of Independence that this is an axiom. We must educate the public. Now your children and my children will probably get, receive an education if the state of Texas didn't pick it up. But what about the thousands, the millions of public school children here in this state? that are looking to the state of Texas. In our Constitution, we said it is the primary obligation of the state to establish a free and efficient public education system. I take that oath when I swore allegiance to this state. When I, I took that oath to say, the first obligation that I feel is important is we must maintain a public education system. And so when, when the proposal comes out, that we need to take public dollars and move them to private or parochial schools without any accountability, without any transparency, without any open oh, let's enrollment. Stop. Let's stop right there. Okay. Is it taking public dollars, which now the, 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 de the Declaration of Independence and the Texas Constitution says mm -hmm. we have to provide an education for everyone, universal education. I guess they could probably call it public education in the Constitution, so to be a constitutionalist, I should say public education. Yes. Um, What's the difference? Why don't this, if I give you $10,500 to send your kid to Cornerstone Christian and someone else's uh, parents want to send them to San Angeles Central, they're both getting educated. And, you're, and the state is still paying, you know, the same amount roughly, right? Not, not really. What you're asking for is to take public dollars and transfer those to private hands. And the idea still has some merit, I admit. Mm -hmm. We do that for special needs kids right now. If a, if a child is not receiving what they need from a public school, then there are programs that that child gets those special services elsewhere or supplements. Right. The problem is that costs about $4 billion a year. We only pay $2 billion. So we're underfunding access to special needs kids. So you're using special needs kids kind of as, as a macroeconomic model of what might happen with, right. with the uh, public school versus private school programs. Correct. But, but here's the distinction. I believe in choice. Every parent here has the opportunity to decide where your kid goes to school. In San Angelo, we have a wonderful public school. We have a wonderful public charter school. We have wonderful private or parochial schools, Ambleside, Cornerstone, Angelo Catholic, Trinity Lutheran. And we have one of the largest homeschool communities in the state here in San Angelo. That's a, parent, that's a parent's choice. But what they're asking, and the proposal at hand, Joe, is to take those public dollars and move them to private or parochial hands 
without the same accountability, without the same transparency, without the same testing, without the same open enrollment policy. So, so what you're saying is that with the way the plan was proposed, you could cherry pick the best students, the most talented athletes, the best musicians, the, the kids that had the most involved parents, pay for their private school, move them into the private school system, and leave the public school with the ones of maybe special needs kids, behavioral problems, things like that, and then expect them to compete on an even scale. Exactly. Keep in mind, vouchers doesn't go to the parent. When you show up with a voucher to the school, the, cho the school has the choice whether to let that child in or not. Mm -hmm. If that child doesn't look like other students at that school, doesn't behave so there, like... So there's no anti-discrimination uh, cap... I mean, doesn't this law prevent you from being discriminating? No. Okay, no. So, you, so they can just do whatever they want to. That's why they're private. <laughs> they use <laughs> private funds for that. But we, I would think but the when federal, you, federal when you, step when you put public dollars, government dollars, mm -hmm. into that private environment, then government strings are, should be attached to But that. they're not. Well, it's up to the legislature to set, legislature to set the terms. So of the, how the, the bill that you fought over, over several terms, that, you know, Abbott kept calling you back, Governor Abbott kept, did they have any kind of accountability in those? In those they in those, did. They so did. What kind of accountability did this public private They had to test. Have? They had to test. The private school had to test. They had to take the had, test. There had to be an accountability system where the school and the student but, had to take But a what test. about anti-discrimination or could they could they say that you can't... Uh, we, we couldn't put that in there. Didn't have that in the bill. But the reality is schools make that determination. Again, if private schools typically, well, almost universally, never take a student if they're behavioral issues. If that child is acting up, that school's not going to take that child. If that child has a learning disability and that school is not equipped professionally and or uh, with, with uh, technology to handle the needs of that child, then they're going to refuse. That voucher means nothing to that private school if they don't want to let that child in. Okay. And so public schools have those things. Public schools have to take children. If they show up at the door, they have to take that child. Doesn't matter about the learning disability. Doesn't matter about the behavioral issues. They have to take that child. Let's talk money. So a the the last voucher bill that you considered in the house, I believe had a they were talking ten thousand five hundred dollars per child. If I take that ten thousand five hundred dollars per child and it follows them around, obviously I'm going to have to plus up. The public school to 10500 per kid because they're supposed to be equal, right? So if I move this child from public school to private school, what I'm being told is it's a revenue neutral event. It doesn't impact the budgets of the, of, the private, of, the, of the public school. And where I'm getting at is like Robert Lee or Christoval. When my kid went to Christoval, they had 20 people in the graduating class. That's a small school. And if you take five kids out of there, that's a lot of allotment that you would take out, right? Absolutely. So is this is it, is it an even trade, a revenue neutral thing, or what does it do to the public school? Well, first of all, the basic allotment for schools is $6,200. So just to make sure you understand what the basic, what he's talking about, the basic allotment for schools would be every student, that's why the SEISD or San Angelo ISD is so worried about their enrollment, right? They have about 13,500 kids, they get paid what, 6,000? 6, 6,200. 6,200 per kid? But they're not getting ten five per kid. So if I take that, so I'm, they're going to lose sixty two hundred bucks if that kid comes out, and the private school is going to get ten thousand five hundred. I can tell you that was loudly discussed on the floor of the house. Why should we pay somebody ten thousand five hundred to leave a school, especially in rural Texas, which is more than what the state is paying towards that school, that student in public schools? So it's not a revenue neutral thing for public schools. No, it's not a revenue neutral thing. And, I mean, we, we tried, um, we, we tried, the Public Education Committee listened to a lot of folks and tried to, tried to structure a plan that if you leave a rural school, then the state would continue paying that for two years, but at, that, at the end of that time, 
they would lose all support for that child. So you continue to pay the 6,200 bucks for two Correct. years. And and he, he, here's, this is not conservative to create an entitlement program. A third entitlement program. We have a entitlement program. It's called the Public School Foundation Program. We have a lot of entitlement programs. We have Medi Medicare. Exactly. And we have Social Security. Yeah. I mean, don't get, don't yell at me. I know y'all paid into it. We all <laughs> paid into it, right? But um, entitlement programs are overcoming the budget of the federal the federal budget. I mean, they have very little discretionary money to spend. Just like the state of Texas, I'm sure. I think you're down to what 18 percent. That really is. It's actually 12 percent. 12 percent. Yeah, and, and so was this money coming? That this I understand this money was coming out of that small little slither. That, that's shared with Texas DPS and a lot of in prisons and a lot of other essential services. To give you an idea, this entitlement program that the governor and others wanted to create would be $4 billion a biennium in the third and the fourth year. $4 billion. Give you an idea how much that is. So it's, so it's about $2 billion a year. $2 billion a year in the third and fourth year. There are projections to go to seven to eight billion in in the out years. How much is public school right now? Roughly? How much we paid in this foundation school program? About ninety billion. Ninety billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to add this other thing that's going to be grow quickly to four to eight to ten well, billion. You know, there are some in the state want a universal voucher program. There are currently about a million students, 250,000 in private schools and 750,000 students in being homeschooled. Mm -hmm. If you have a universal savings account, then without taking a single child out of public schools, the million kids that, quote, get a universal plan, that would be $21 billion a biennium. And this is in addition to the foundation schools program, which we're already Absolutely. obligated to spend money on. Correct. So let me ask you this. If we did all this and we go down this road, how are we going to pay for it? Well, that's the point. 12% of the budget is discretionary. The rest, 88%, is governed by formula. Foundation school program, Medicaid, all of these things, transportation funding, it's all allocated. When we when Watch we, out for that microphone. Okay. okay. When, when we approve money for roads, that set aside money that's sort of going into general revenue would go into funding roads. All of that's 88 percent. 12 percent is what we as budget writers get to play with. Four billion dollars vouchers, years three and four. We fund four billion dollars a year for DPS. We fund, we fund three billion dollars a year for prisons. We spend four billion dollars a biennium for border security. So you're talking about th th this voucher program in the next legislative would session compete, will cost more. It would compete against the other priority needs of this state, whether it be Tech Dot, I mean not Tech Dot, DPS, border security, and then I mentioned 18 billion dollars worth of property tax. Well, if you relief. have you have 90 billion dollars in this, the, the public school foundation budget. Why don't you just carve some out of that? It, it's constitutionally uh, dedicated to the funding of the schools. So you can't you can't really save much money on public schools pulling students out and putting them into private schools. No, you can't do it just because of the inertia, bureaucracy, or you could say we have school districts. I can look at San Angelo ISD where we have an administration. We have a certain amount of schools. You start closing down elementary schools. We have riots, <laughs> right? Because elementary schools are defining communities inside of San Angelo, just like Cristobal High School, middle school, elementary school define Cristobal. And I keep using Cristobal because that's where my kids went to school, but I can use wall, but the wall people might get mad at me for mentioning wall right now because they have a little coach controversy. But anyway, <laughs> I, don't right, want to touch I, that. I have one last question about the, about the school stuff. You know, the parent that says, you know, I really care about my kids. I go to I go to Catholic Mass every I'm going to use wall. I go to St. Ambrose every Sunday. We never miss it. I don't think these public schools with all their wokeness and their their uh, CRT, you know, critical race theory and um, I mean, I know that I saw a, a, a school counselor from a local school district here use pronouns on his email. Scared me when I saw it first, but 
They no longer share my values. Why do I want to support this? They're the very lifeblood of the communities that, that we have out here in West Texas. We, yes, we've passed a lot of bills that, that push back against woke agenda, critical race theory. Um, we have passed laws that, that uh, are designed to clean up our libraries, for example, House Bill 900 in the last session. Um, all of those le legitimate concerns. But I'm also the, of the opinion a lot of these issues have been enhanced and, in, and, and grown by the same people that are casting these lies. They have an agenda to make money off public education. They have, a, this has been a long-term plan to destroy public trust in our public schools. COVID played into that. We all saw what happened when we shut access to our public schools away from our kiddos. But I think this has been a, a coordinated, dedicated effort to destroy confidence in our public schools by those that will, wish to profit from it. They wish to privatize, in their words, they wish to privatize government schools government schools or at least create an entitlement an upper middle class entitlement so that you can have the government pay for your kids choice in, in public and private schools. exactly um, I don't know if y'all have y'all heard enough about private schools public schools yes. boring now huh <laughs> the next the next thing we got to talk about and this is this is what's driving the polls right now border security what the heck can a state legislator do about border security? I mean, it's a federal domain, and you've been you've been in the middle of this for what a decade? Absolutely, I've been down to the border countless times. I've been out in the in the boats. I've looked at the the problem. Really, the only thing that we uh, have, can do and are doing is toughening our laws. We have now made it in this past legislative session. A crime to enter this country illegally and if, if if you're found to have done that your first time it's a class B misdemeanor the second time it's a class A misdemeanor so to put that in perspective a class B misdemeanor is something that you can be jailed for it's not like if you get in a fight in a bar it could be a class C misdemeanor class B is elevated a little bit I hope my law enforcement people can back me up on that <laughs> based on my news reporting so if you want to get on San Angel live get a class B misdemeanor <laughs> Anyway, keep going. I, I, but, and Bill Walls. I mean, we we have uh, 1.6 billion dollars we appropriated in November uh, to build more wall. Uh, we do have, you think this is good money uh, we're spending? Because you had a 30, almost a 33 billion dollar surplus. That's a lot of tax cut for property taxes. And you guys know, I know, back in May, June, what was the biggest issue? Property tax valuation. We had a $32 billion surplus this year. Should we be spending that on, on border security the way we are, at the rate we are? Well, are you saying, suggesting we needed to spend more on property tax relief? I think so. And less on border security? Well, I mean, I think that would be a conservative I mean, Republican position. We spent almost $12 billion the last three biennium on border security, doing a job that the federal government should have done. Can we build the government, the federal government? I certainly hope our, our elected officials are keeping that in their back pocket and that when we have a Republican administration, we can get to the maybe kid. we can present a bill and maybe pay the bill. Yeah. yeah. All right. Border security, obviously big. The other tripe I hear out there on the Internet uh, you know, do y'all watch the Tucker Carlson interviews? Uh, he interviewed uh, uh, Ken Paxton uh, probably two months ago. Uh, you, if you haven't seen it, go look at it. In there, he talked about how in the Texas House, how it's built up, and you cannot be elected speaker without, being a, you know, without getting Democrat support. Ken Paxton said that, yeah. right? So I always want an inside scoop on this. In 2018, I don't know if any of you guys know this, but uh, our representative Drew Darby almost was elected speaker. So what's, tell me about the process of, of getting well, elected. And, and do you really have to have Democrats support you? No. You know? 
No, in fact, the last three speakers have been elected um, with uh, Republican support. Uh, we, we, cha we, cha we changed the process. So how, how did you ch so you change the process so you can be elected speaker without Democrats voting? Assuming for the Republicans hold the majority in the House, which is 76 votes, mm -hmm. then after the election, the Texas House meets in Republican caucus in December and we meet for the purpose of determining our preferred candidate for speaker. And it obviously has to be unanimous, right? Doesn't have to be. You have to have two thirds vote of the caucus to be the preferred candidate. Okay. And so we, the last two uh, cycles, we've elected a speaker based upon two thirds, it was actually 100% of the Republican caucus and on both times. Uh, so even these even these uh, wild right wing conservatives to, or right wing Republicans today who say they don't like the speaker voted for him to be speaker. The Republicans elected that speaker. Was it pretty much unanimous? I yeah. guess it had to be. Yes. Yeah. All right. So well, there may have been one or two from, from the from the from the knowledgeable seats. One <laughs> did. <laughs> so one so didn't. why do we why do we have to um, why do we have to appoint uh, Democrats to committees or to committee chairmanships? Well, let me point out a, a numerical problem. Do you like your property tax relief? Yeah, I love my Did property. you like increasing your homestead exemption from forty to a hundred thousand? Oh, I loved it. Did you like uh, uh, setting up a Texas University fund that benefits Texas Tech University and yes. Angelo State University and all these wonderful things? How about things. infrastructure, water? Energy. Yes, we need more water out here. Uh, how about uh, <laughs> how about uh, um, uh, so internet access. Are you all of that, all, uh, all that I'm telling you is that it sounds good in principle, but when you start trying to total up support for an initiative that makes sense, you have to have 100 votes. There are 85 Republicans. You got to get to 100. If, if you start isolating folks without participating in the process, then you can't get those things that we all here find valuable and worthy. These are, these are folks that represent 200,000 so people we, like we, I do. So without a supermajority, shut the cake hole about the, the Democrat chairs, or give me a supermajority of Republicans. You, I've been, I've served in my 18 years, I've served one time when we had 100 and and two Republicans. Did you have Democrat chairs then? Yes. yes because you have to make sausage. <laughs> because because you get stuff there done, are right? issues that that we have to collaborate on for the good of Texans. Is the system built that way? It's always been built that way. When Democrats controlled, uh, Tom Craddock sat on as chairman of many a committee. You know, when he first came. Uh, there were nine Republicans in the legislature. Uh, he built it into a Republican majority. And during that whole time, uh, the speakers would appoint Republicans as chairs of committees. Okay. So the Democrat chairs of committees is kind of like this, it's just a shouting point. The, the, there's, ne there's not a single Democratic chaired committee that doesn't have a majority of Republicans on that committee. So nothing will be voted out of that committee that the Republicans don't agree upon. Gotcha. All right, one last thing. Obviously, elections are about the future. Two more years. If you get reelected, what are we looking for, looking at as far as priorities for the next two years? Well, f first and foremost, after this election, Governor Abbott and I are going to sit down. <laughs> Maybe we'll smoke a peace pipe, <laughs> but certainly we will talk about everyone in this room and about how you're going to meet the needs that your family is going to have to need over the next two years. That requires cooperation. That requires communication. 
And I fully. I, I just want you know. There's. It seems to me, just looking at it from the news pers news media perspective, there is no communications between the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who runs the Senate, and the Speaker of the House. Does the governor even talk to any of them? I heard the governor doesn't like the lieutenant governor. I mean, what is going on with Republicans not liking Republicans and not getting stuff done? It's awful, isn't it? I just well, I, I can I can tell you this that almost all the senators are former House members. We call them House Broken. They're all House Broken, <laughs> and so <laughs> some of them can control themselves, some can't. But. Uh, but we have one-on-one -on -one commu communications. I mean, s members of the legislature talk to members of the Senate. We talk. I mean, we, we talk about what's important, how to craft something. And in the end, yes, they kind of control the agenda from afar. But on a daily basis, we control the agenda. If we want to vote something out of the committee, then we can. If we want to consider a bill, we can. And so. You know, so there I, is communication. Look, there is communication. Absolutely, there's com communication. There should be. There should be communication. Statewides have their own agendas, but we that are serving want to represent the folks back home. And I go back to my initial statement the best defense to somebody lying about you. It's to vote your district. And everyone in that room is supposed to follow that. Now, I may not agree with them, but they're supposed to vote their district. And I have to look at that. I went, go, why in the world did they vote for that? Mm -hmm. Well, their district is different, and it requires it. So I think what the public want, they don't want somebody to go down there and stick a, a sword in the ground and said, from this point, I will not retreat. <laughs> you know that's that's not a right. that's not a policy that long term benefits Texans. Do you think you can make up with uh, Governor Abbott? Absolutely, <laughs> folks. This is about one vote. I have carried Governor Abbott's bills and water since he became governor. Before he was governor, he was an attorney general. And if you remember, we've had some problems here in the in the uh, in the district. He honored his word. I was one of the first elected officials to endorse him for governor. I've carried two redistricting maps under his leadership, keeping our Republican majorities. I've carried Article Five Convention of the States. Y'all know what that is? Some do. It's like we'll have a we'll have a constitutional convention call and rewrite the Constitution. I was the committee chairman in the House for that bill, so we had a big celebration when he signed that bill. Mm -hmm. We had three or four hundred people at the governor's mansion. Old Drew, but not right now. Not right now. <laughs> not right now. He told me. Before I took that vote, he looked me in the eye and said, Drew, I need your support. Governor? Need your support on the voucher on the vouchers. Bill. Okay. I said, Governor, it's bad for my district, I can't. He said, will you walk the boat? Walking means I just conveniently off the floor at the time. A lot of people do that. So walking the boat means just not be there. Just not be there. And then you can come back after the vote and register your but one way or another. Which, that's the, where it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's yeah. chicken way of doing it. Or you, he said, well, you consider white light. In it. White light is even worse. It's saying, I'm not going to vote yay, I'm not going to vote nay. I'm just going to be a white light in the middle. I told him, I'm not a white light guy. He said, well, you know that if you do this, I'm going to find somebody and run against you and endorse them. Governor, with all due respect, I do not represent you. I represent the folks back home. Amen. And that's and that's why we're here today. That's that's why we're here. I knew what was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen. 
Did you imagine how much money they would pour into it? No, no. Ooh. Now, just looking I, at the money, they're spending, I don't know, anywhere. It's real hard to figure out because these are all, these are all different packs. And I've looked at all the campaign finance reports, which, by the way, uh, Representative Darby's opponent, as of last time I looked, which was like Friday evening, she hadn't even filed her campaign finance report for February 5th. Um, but they're spending probably close to 15000 20000 a week. That's what that's what oh, I'm no, thinking. Oh, no, more than that. You think it's more than oh, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's 15000 a mailer. Uh, how many of y'all getting just one mailer a week? You Maybe know. I was looking at just the TV how buys. Text, <laughs> how many text messages you're getting? You know, how many, how many TikTok ads or whatever? <laughs> They're spending a lot of money. I'd, right. I'd say million and a half, $2 million perhaps. Uh, and I'm do, not do you think? Do you think you're going to survive? Do you think you're going to get? I know I'm going to survive. I've got a beautiful wife. <laughs> I've got I've got f five children, all happily married with eleven grandchildren. Drew Darby is going to be fine. This is not about Drew Darby. We're going to be fine. Mom and I are going to be fine. She's honey and I'm Papa. <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that, folks. <laughs> We're going to be fine. What I worry about. And it would have been easy. There were 21 of us Republicans that voted against the vouchers. Five already decided they were going to hang it up. I'm not going to worry with all this stuff. There's 16 of us that took a very important vote for our districts. And they're, they're coming for those 15, 16. But if if the governor and the folks that live outside this country, this state are successful, then they'll simply run over rural Texas. And I can't say it any plainer than that. And the money, the money they can make is significant because you carved out, or you didn't, but that legislation had carved out 5% of the 500 million to be find a contract. outside vendors, outside, outside vendors. vendors that would maintain uh, accounting for the software or maintain the savings accounts and guess by and oh yes by the way that five percent there's another three percent to the controller to handle the money that's eight percent off the top. So that's, 20, you, that's okay. That's about thirty million dollars. We were talking about a five hundred million dollar five hundred. You talk about budget dust 500 million but would grow to four billion dollars or perhaps double that that becomes a pretty good amount of money that's a pretty good amount of money to manage accounts and to explain it there's proprietary software that's needed to be able to manage these these private school vouchers contrary to popular belief even the texas legislature was smart enough to figure out you just didn't want to write them a check <laughs> That's quite a step for the legislature, but I don't think that would have worked. And so we want to make sure the money goes into the account and account. They pay the tuition expenses for that and then watch for it because what you have is students that try it, they don't like it and they want to move back to the public school. So some third party was supposed to monitor all that to make sure there weren't abuses. And so they're all donors right now from Virginia. Well, there's one six million dollar donor donor out of Pennsylvania that makes money off software. There you go. Gave it to the governor in December. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So Folks. this has been uh, the conversation. How was it? Was it a good conversation? <laughs> Representative Drew Darby, thank you thank for you being so. on our show.